going to continue. There's something that I wanted to share and just look at today. It's kind of a preliminary thought that I haven't really developed, but it's something I felt like was necessary to discuss. And it corresponds to the study we've been doing in Ephesians. So I'm going to look at that at the beginning. But today I want to talk about the need and the nature of spiritual growth. Um, I think people have a, a wrong or a, at least a misconception with regard to spiritual growth. And the truth of spiritual growth uh, flies in the face of all of our concepts with regard to it as it always does. So I want to talk about it today. It seems almost uh, wrong when we look at it the way we're going to talk about it and discuss it, but, but I, I, I promise you, this is the only means by which the soul actually comes to stand firm in a reality that God has placed it in, that what God has done in it. And so Paul's letter to the Ephesians begins, as we know, most of us know, that it begins by Paul describing just the greatness of our salvation, the magnitude of the reality, such as being blessed with all spiritual blessings. I mean, we could take each phrase and spend eternity just trying to exhaust the immensity of the statements. What does it mean, blessed with all spiritual blessings? I mean, how can you possibly condense that into a theology or a, just a particular doctrine? It's, a, it's an immense thing. It's eternal. It's that which was preordained of God himself that we have received. When it speaks of being accepted, or as the word is, be graced in the beloved, and having redemption and forgiveness of sins and the inheritance that was always promised, this is what we've received in Christ. And according to verse 9 and 10, what we have received in Christ is the actual, the, the divine wrapping up of God's eternal will and God's eternal intent. And all of this is bestowed through the abiding presence of the life of the one perfect man who abides in the soul, the one who, who abides in us and has made unto us all things. Those of us who believe, who have surrendered to the mercy and grace of God as was sung about today, and I was real appreciative for the songs because it ties so well because of this grace, and there's a steadfastness that comes with this, but it's not our own. And that's the beauty. And we're going to, uh, when it comes to this growth that we're going to discuss, that's the whole point that Peter, when he speaks of growing in the grace of God, the whole point is that you would not be prey to wicked and lawless men who would make you move and stumble from your steadfastness. Most people live in a state where there is no steadfast and there's no stability, which is what that word also means. There's no, nothing that girds you and holds you in place when everything else seems to not be that way. I'm speaking of not, not necessarily natural things. It applies there as well, but we're talking about a spiritual thing. Most people's idea of salvation has a lot of ups and downs and variables attached to it. But the scripture says that in him, that's the one who abides in us, the one who has made unto us salvation, there is no variable at all. There is a constant, permanent state that he affords and bestows to the soul in which he abides. Through salvation we have received the man, the eternal personage unto whom God looks and finds his resting place, finds his own satisfaction. And it is that transaction that God has wrought in us that brings our soul into an anchored position or a state of being. And unfortunately, we can miss the, the, the weight of those statements and we can focus on very superficial things in Christianity, things that mean nothing when it comes to the vast eternal weight of glory that we're faced with in Christ. It's just nothing. 
And that's our majors most of the time, is the nothingness of our superficial pursuits. When there is all the time an eternal, universal truth that encompasses and borders the soul and makes it secured in something that never changes, that has not even the, not even the momentary threat of changing. We are not strong enough to change it. We're not strong enough to make a variable in this. It holds us when we cannot, well, we never can, but in the midst of our being weak and not able to hold ourselves, it holds us, anchors us, keeps us. What abides in us is an ever-abiding, keeping, functional, effectual power. And it is without a doubt greater than any any word can just convey. You can't put it in a nutshell and in a cleverly devised, you know, turn of phrase, this salvation. This is actually Christ in us. Christ in us who are born again is actually what Paul describes as that which is exceedingly, abundantly above all that we can ask or think. That's who he is. And we conflate other things with it and we confuse it and we try to add to it to make it sound even greater. But there's nothing greater than just the simpleness of Christ in you. And we've talked about this already. Christ in you, Paul's warning was and his, his really the trouble that it was in his heart was that the Corinthians and all the church really would be swayed away and deceived and deviated from the simplicity that is in Christ. Christianity lives in the multiplicity of religious activity. We don't focus on the simplicity. And the beauty of that is that the word simplicity in the Greek actually means singleness, but it also simultaneously means bountiful. And you think, how in the world does a single thing also equal bountiful? Because we're talking about Christ. We're talking about one in whom all is realized. All things of God is found. So in him dwells the fullness of God. In that one, God's fullness makes its permanent home. And it pleased God for such to be the case. And the grace of God toward us is that that's the one he has gifted to the soul and given to your soul the one he is satisfied with. He's not turning to us and say, satisfy me. That's what religion does. That's what men will do. That deviates your heart from a gift that God has given. And we're so busy trying to pursue the stuff that we're told to pursue. We don't focus on the singleness of a gift so that our soul would grow in the comprehension of a gift that's greater than ourselves, a salvation that is greater than us. It is because it is not of us at all. I'm always puzzled. And my whole life was, you know, when I began, became a Christian and the whole pursuits that Christianity will put in front of you, I just had to get all my ducks in a row. That is what it was all about, getting your stuff together, get your ducks in a row. The problem is half my ducks died, and the other half were just swimming in circles. And I'm thinking, how do you get ducks in a row? It's like herding fleas. There's no way. So we give them things, and I used to think, man, Christianity puts on you standards that are impossible to meet. But they don't. The truth is, Christianity actually puts on you standards that you can meet given the right amount of effort. That's the danger. Because if it's something I can attain, then I'm going to go after it. When it's something I can't attain, I'm going to fall upon the mercy of one who's offering to me what I can't attain. I'm going to fall there and submit to a gift instead of trying with all my heart and all my efforts, sincerely so, to attain something that's unattainable for me. And what we don't realize is the moment we're born again, our soul actually submits to something that is of that nature. 
It is God giving to the soul what your soul cannot have by efforts, by works, by deeds, no matter how great they are, no matter how obedient you think you are. It's the obedience of one man, Paul says, that makes us right. And we're still pursuing it. We're still going after it. All of our obedience should be in the light of our being found in the one who is obedient. All of our activities should be in the light of being found in him who has made unto us what our work can never attain. So we don't do work to attain it. We do work out from the fact that it is already attained in us by the power and sufficiency of another. Christ in you brings into your soul that which is exceeding and abundantly beyond what you can even imagine to conceive the thought of. And in the light of this type of salvation, this reality, Paul prays for the church here in Ephesians. Because this is the reality he's been describing throughout the first part of this chapter. And it's not isolated to the Ephesian church. It's, it's for the whole of the church. He just particularly writes to the Ephesians these words. But he echoes the sentiment in every letter he writes. And this is the prayer, the desire, the heart Paul has for the church to comprehend, to know, to recognize, and live in the acknowledgement of a work that God has wrought. So he starts in verse 15. I'm reading this out of the English Standard Version. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this cause, or for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, and remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. See, the sing singleness of it. It's not that I, you know, I want, him, I want him to give you the knowledge of all of these things. He's just said we were blessed with all spiritual blessings. You think he would enumerate a few of them that he wants us to comprehend. He does. Him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Flooded with light. That you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Again, not a hope unfulfilled, but the very hope God has fulfilled to which he has called you. That hope realized, an expectation, which is the word, an expectation God set forth in testimony under the law, under the old covenant, but is now realized in the person of Jesus Christ. He's called you to this. Well, you need to know it. You need to comprehend that to which he's called you. The nature of it, the greatness of it. And here's part of it. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance that is in the saints? And what is the immeasurable? Listen to words. He's just trying to exhaust his language to try to show you how great this is. The greatness, the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. This is an immense thing that we are called to know, that Paul is praying for us to comprehend. This can't come by books and learning of men. This is way beyond the scope of man's intellect. It can't happen that way. Can we pursue the, the scriptures in that way? Absolutely. But you have to actually submit yourself to know the actual truth of this is beyond us. But as I was looking at the last part of these verses, 21 through 23, I was struck by something I want to just look at for a second with you because it continues on. It shows you the answer to something that is always the question. 
kind of a universal, eternal question that's been there. Not eternal, but since man's existed. So this stood out to me. Notice the wording of this. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. He put all things under his feet, gave him as head over all things to the church, his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. That's the church, that which is filled all of us with his fullness. His fullness fills all. That's what makes it the body. That's what makes it the church. You know, if you're not filled with the fullness of him, you can't be the church. You can't be the body. That, that, that gives us something to think about. Most people don't think they're filled with anything. They know nothing about it. you are complete in him. But, but as I was reading these verses, I thought of Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5, starting there, reading, I think it's through verse 9. And the whole letter of Hebrews, of course, is Paul, or whoever you think wrote Hebrews, describing the greatness of Christ when compared to all of the things that came before, all of the testimony, all of the priesthood and all of that. He's showing him, he's exalting Christ as that better thing that was always coming, that better reality that was always promised, even in the shadows of a testimony. This is what God always intended, and he has now come. God has now spoken fully. He had uttered his mind and amened all things in one man, his son. And so he goes into Hebrews chapter 2 and he begins to show Christ is greater than what man assumes he was designed to be. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5. For he did not give to angels the administration of the inhabited earth to come concerning which we are speaking. But one in a certain place testified saying, this is Weiss translation, I'm sorry. What is man? that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you look upon him in order to come and aid him? That's a question, right? I've had that question a lot of times. Why are you still here? If I was you, I would not be. But you wake up and he's still there. And you're confused because you know if he went by the same standards as you do and people tell you are the standards, you would be caught dead near you. But he's still there. And you say, what is this about? What, why? What is man that you are mindful of him? Here's, here's part of the question. Here's why. You made him a little lower. For a little time, lower than angels, with glory and honor, you crowned him. All things you put in subjection under his feet. Remember what we just read in the feet. You just put all things subjected under his feet. For in that he put all things in subjected under him, speaking of men, mankind. He left not even one thing that is not put under his feet. But now, we see not all things put under him. This hadn't worked out the way it was supposed to, right? Man's really screwed up. The things you intended for man is not here. We don't see this happening. Everything's chaos. It's all wrong, right? And so we continue to ask the question, why do you deal with man at all? Well, here's why. But Jesus. But Jesus who was made for a little time lower than the angels, sounds familiar, right? With the design that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. We see him crowned as the victor. With glory and honor because of the suffering of death. You see, the question was always, what is man? The answer is given right here. Stop trying to find it in the men you're looking for it in. We see Jesus. There's the answer for men. Everything man assumed he was intended to be 
was not intended to be found in men. It was always intended to be found in a man. That's the one we see. And this is a profound declaration of the triumph of the cross, the victory that has been brought about, what we call salvation. The victory that we, in whom Christ dwell, partake. For so many, that question, again, lingers, and the search for an answer to man and his failure and his dilemmas continue. For those who are even born of the Spirit, that continues. And religion tries to give you the answer and says, here's how you measure up. Here's how you finally reach that level. Here's how you finally make it. Get the stuff together so God can nod and say, you're good. The answer is never found in men. It's found in one man. There's the simplicity of it all. There's the grace and the mercy that has been bestowed. In the words of Paul, we're made aware of the victory, the exceeding work wrought of God and when he raised Christ up from the dead in Ephesians 1. The answer to man is that the reality was never found, or to be found, or intended to be found in natural men. It was always to be found, fully reckoned, Eternally answered in Christ. And we see Jesus. That's the answer. Seeing Christ. Possessing him has brought you to that state. Having him in you has already brought you to that. But seeing him makes your soul aware and cognizant of the salvation you have received that is greater than men. Not of you, but of him. See, this is the culmination of it all. This is not showing Jesus to be the means for men to finally reach his intended place. It is actually declaring Jesus Christ as the place God intended for men to finally reach. And showing you that's where you are. That's the gospel. If it's not that, that's not the gospel. Salvation itself, the soul being joined to, found in the man under whose feet God has finally placed all things, given him glory, crowned him with honor. It is that man that is the head of his church. It is that man who has full preeminence. It is that man whose face is the identity of his body and his church. It is that man's fullness that fills us. And you would say, then that must be why the soul must see that man. Otherwise, we're just trying to see in men what is only found in a man. And we're the first face we gander on, right? The heart must be flooded with his light, his perception, his perspective must dawn in the hearts of men. Because otherwise we are always limited by the level of our intellect, the level of of our brain power. And that's not very much. I don't care how much you think. It's not that much. When you're talking about divine things, we all assume we know something. We don't. If a man thinks he knows, Paul says he knows not yet as he ought to know. Because that's part of growth. That's part of spiritual growth. It's recognizing I can't. I'm not. He is. And being able to rejoice in the fact of that instead of trying to fight against the fact of that. Instead of that being a exposure of your frailty and your weakness, you think of it as being the very tabernacle that tabernacles around you where you can say, as Paul said, I glory in my weakness for when I am weak, I am strong. Because I'm tabernacled with the fullness of another man. I live in the grace that is sufficient for me. God's desire for the soul in whom he's bestowed such a gift is to become acquainted with the nature of that gift. The greatness, the divine power that that gift actually continually and consistently, without fail, exercises. And... 
I mean, take a look at what he says at the very uh, first part of chapter 2. This is after he said all this. This is what I want you to do. I want your soul to be enlightened that you may know, and here's why. Because you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You have to think, man, that means I didn't have much to do with all of this. <laughs> I mean, wh where were you in this picture? Dead. How much power did you have to make this happen? None. This had to be God's doing. And see, that's the whole point. It's always God's doing. We were hearing it in the songs. Where there is a continual and desperate need of grace, there is the continual ongoing provision of grace. Because the need of grace never ends, and the provision of grace never ends. The vessel always needs the treasure to, be, to have sufficiency. When you think the vessel has sufficiency in and of itself, you are deceived. And you'll hit that wall eventually. We all will. But the fact is, the gospel should proclaim the sufficiency of the treasure in the vessel so that the vessel can desire to know a reality that keeps him safe. As the song said, he's the only place of safety we have. Your works don't keep you safe because they'll change in volume and quality eventually. I always say, you know, my grandmother, she was always concerned. Especially when she got to the age she couldn't do the stuff. And because she got sicker and sicker, she thought God was punishing her because she couldn't do the stuff as much as she could at the age of 90. And you try to talk, but you know, it's, it's an embedded thing. Only God can change that. Why don't we just hear the gospel? That'd make it easy, wouldn't it? At least just hear the gospel so upon the basis of truth we could go to God and say, show me that reality in the face of Jesus. Let me see something that holds me when my body breaks down and my mind goes. That I don't have to be the intellectual giant that I assume I am. When my brain is no longer functional, guess what? There is still a functioning power that keeps you, holds you. That's mercy. We were dead. God had to do something. And in the midst of that death, while we were still weak and still in our sins and trespasses, he performed a work. He called us to himself. He invited us to partake of a supper that he had made ready. And this was done in God in the midst of our deadness. So he goes on in Ephesians 2, verse 4 God who is rich in mercy. You're dead, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with him. And then the parenthetical statement defining what that is, by grace you are saved. And he has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he would show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. King James says through. The word's actually in. Where does that mean? Out here in the universe, he's going to show that? No, that means in us. He's going to show it to us. He's going to display eternally the fullness of the mercy and kindness that he has in Christ bestowed to us. The riches of that. That's Man, that's an eternal occupation, seeing the riches of this grace, knowing. I mean, I'd much rather, as I sit here today, know it while I'm in this body. <laughs> but when I'm not, I'm still going to see, know, explore, discover the depths of this gift. How many times, notice, he uses the word grace here so many times. And so you look at that and you take a look at the nature of this grace. Where he keeps going and he says this. He shows the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, he reiterates it again. By grace are you saved through faith. 
and not of yourselves. That not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. That describes something of the nature of grace. And when you look at this whole idea of the grace that now governs us, that we are saved, the grace that has brought wholeness to the soul, which is what salvation actually means. When it says saved, it means wholeness, altogether whole. And he says this in Colossians uh, the, basically the mirror image of this verse says it according to those who have been brought out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his beloved his beloved son his dear son and that would bring us to Solomon that whole picture the queen of Sheba you know comes to Solomon sees him faints in front of him because of his glory and his wisdom and who he was and it's because she had just seen now the, the person who exceeded all the words that she had heard about him and the king under whose rule it says of that land there was only peace and that no enemy or evil occurrence was present in the land that he ruled. That's the Solomon. That's the greater than Solomon that abides in us. That was the whole picture of it. And this is the grace, salvation, that makes it possible and actually makes it the state and the case that concerning our soul it is written holy and without blame before him in love. That's impossible otherwise. And how in the world is that case? And we read that word and we read that phrase, holy and without blame, and maybe not vocally, but internally we're like, <laughs> how in the world is that possible? Well, with men it's not. With God it is. That's a simple enough and a sufficient enough answer. Should be. And I know I say these things a lot, but if there's a hill I'm willing to die on, this is it. We're talking about sufficiency. In the midst of our weakness, because that never goes away. Sufficiency. And how amazing is the grace of God. You have to ask yourself a question like that, right? How amazing is this grace by which we've been saved? So with that, I want to talk about spiritual growth because this is basically what the seeing of Jesus, the revelation of Christ brings into the heart, is growth. Again, there's been a misconception with regard to growth. So I want to go to Peter and what he says. This is from the Weist uh, translation of the New Testament. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. He says this, As for you, therefore, divinely loved ones, knowing these things beforehand, be constantly on your guard. Same warnings Paul does many times in his letter. Be constantly on your guard, lest having been carried away by the error of unprincipled lawless men, you fall from your own steadfastness. But be continually growing in the sphere of God's grace and an experiential knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and and to the day of eternity. Now, just, just consider that. That's Paul's warning, or Peter's warning to them. And I love that. Put up your guard lest you fall from your own steadfastness fastness by the unprincipled men who would deviate your heart. It's the same as Paul saying in Colossians, they would beguile you and deceive you with their vain philosophy. What does that mean? They're trying to add something to Jesus. They're trying to add something to your salvation. They're trying to lessen the sufficiency of a sufficient grace. Paul would say in Galatians chapter 5 concerning this same thing, Behold, verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Can't have that. You can't have grace and works. 
You can't have a righteousness internal and try to also have one external. There's only one. For I testify to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. If you think that's your pet project, if that's the one you're going to go to, whatever it may be, if you're going to circumcise yourself and this makes me righteous, then guess what? You are now, you have to do the whole thing. Because you held to one part of it, you have to hold to the whole part of it. And you can't not hold and complete the whole of it. That's the problem. You think you can hold on to one piece and the whole thing is the whole of it's what's required. So he goes on, Christ, those who look for righteousness by circumcision or works of the law or any of that, Christ has become of no effect unto you whosoever you are who are justified or tried to be righteous by the law. You have fallen from grace. It's the same thing as him saying, do not lose your steadfastness. Do not lose your stability. Do not lose the grace of God that has come to you. And we're not talking about losing salvation. We're talking about losing perspective with regard to your salvation. Losing the fact that it is of him and not of you. And allow men to bring you back into the picture and give you something to offer. Give you something that you can boast in and get credit for. Just like the workers in the vineyard we've talked about. And the first one say, hey, we worked harder than them. Why do they get the same thing? Because I'm good. And none of it's dependent upon your labor. Never has been. I'm just good enough to give to everybody the same. <laughs> we hate that. Takes all the hierarchies and the levels out of the picture. Thank God. What is our stability? What is our steadfastness? It's this grace. It is the reality spoken in Galatians. Not I, but Christ lives in me. And the desire for righteousness by any other means is a frustration or accounting as nothing the grace of God. And what Paul cites as the losing of your stability or your steadfastness is not the loss of salvation. It is, again, losing sight of the singular source of salvation, the singular source of your stability before God, your standing before God, where it says he's able to keep us from falling. That means stumble, not fall completely, just stumbling. He keeps you from that. I don't mess up? Of course you do. This shows you how of him and not of you it is. You mess up, he does it. You're screwed up. He's not. That's mercy. That's the grace of God. That's the focus of the soul. That's the grace we should grow in so that we can boast in the sufficiency of another instead of attempting to equalize the picture and make ourselves just like him. That seems to be a lie that was told at the very beginning of the book. And that's still what we're after, most of it. I want to be like him. I want to be like Jesus. Being found in Christ, having nothing of your own, is much greater than that. And that's what God's offered. He didn't give you a means to be Christ-like. He gave you Christ. That's a better deal. But see, that takes us out of the whole thing. It makes us partakers and not participants. It makes us passive recipients instead of active players in the part. And that's the whole work. God's, God said in Genesis 3, my spirit will all, not always strive with men for that he is flesh. And if you look that up, it means that God will not always con condescend himself by dwelling in the midst of flesh where it is, I'm down here in the midst of flesh trying to fix these things, trying to deal with these people. That's not going to happen. That's not the answer. We think that's salvation. God always down here dealing with my mess and helping me through it. 
That's not how God does it. The whole point was, I'm not going to strive this forever this way. And here's the answer. He gives the answer in the same place. He says, I'm not going to do this again. The answer is in, that was said in verse 3 of Genesis 6. The answer is given in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's kind of the same thing, right? But we see Jesus. It is Noah found grace. Here's the answer. This is talking, this is stretching us to a new creation. This is bringing us to the picture of a reality fulfilled in Christ, where he says, it's not about fixing the, we'd much rather be fixed. That's what we're always after. I want to be fixed. God's answer is not to fix you, it's to overcome you. It is to override you and give you the sufficiency of another. That is not I but Christ. I am crucified with him. The overriding power of grace is what God has provided to us. And here it is. Man doesn't meet it. I'm going to destroy him. But there is a man who I have grace, given grace to, who is perfect and righteous. This is the word used. He was a righteous and perfect man, blameless in his generation. That's Christ. That's the one who is the salvation of a creation in whom God would name and identify an entirely new creation. That's what grace has provided. So that we are now found in him. We are, as Paul would say, no longer in the flesh. Again, the answer was not him to dwell in flesh trying to fix it. It was to bring you out of the flesh into the spirit. So Paul would say you're no longer in the flesh. You are in the spirit if the spirit dwells in you. There's the work. There's the work of God. Not I, but Christ. That's the whole picture. And the more perfectly we see this taking on uh, pointing to the reality of the new covenant in a total picture where Noah in the ark begins to release the birds, right? He releases a dove so that he can know the, how things are out there. He can see the state of a new creation. In verse 8 of Genesis 8, it says, he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off of the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of his feet. There was still water there, so he couldn't land. And he returned unto him into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. And then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. That means it's coming, man. It's blooming. The new creation is, is actually producing. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark. Uh, I'm sorry. So Noah knew the waters were abated from, from off the earth. Verse 12, he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove which returned not again unto him anymore. Dove never came back. You know what he knew? Everything's ready. The new creation, that new earth, the new heaven and the new earth has now been prepared and we can now walk on it. We can now live in it. How does that come to be realized? Well, Jesus comes out of the waters of baptism. And the dove that was never seen again in Genesis now descends upon the perfect reality of a new creation. As a dove, the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus coming out of the waters of baptism, and Jesus says, this is the one in whom I am satisfied and well pleased. There's the picture. Jesus comes up as the reality of a new creation. He is now exposed out of the waters of a baptism or a flood, and he is shown to be the new creation. That's what we're seeing. That's grace. Defined in one man. This is him. So when this is the reality we're to grow in. This is spiritual growth, to grow in the comprehension of the one God knows to be who he is. And we would say, be constantly growing. That's the need, constantly growing in the sphere of the grace. There is a realm, a sphere in which we 
this growing must take place. God has placed these boundaries in the realm of our growth. And I could keep going. I've gone too long. But when... Let me just get to the nature of... I mean, again, we've defined the nature of the grace of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That's the nature of grace. Not of you, but of him. Not I, but Christ. That's the nature of the grace of God. So what does it mean to grow in that grace? To grow in the realm and sphere of that grace? See, most of us look, most of us look at grace. And we think it's almost being processed to the point and being worked in by God to the point where the grace and mercy of God is almost not even needed. It's almost obsolete. I don't need it anymore. I'm good. I've got all my habits under my feet. Everything's cool. I don't do those things anymore. I'm good. And guess what? That's not it at all. That's not what the growing in the grace of God. That's not spiritual growth. To finally see yourself leveling up where you're almost there. Spiritual growth is a growth in the grace of God. It is growing in the comprehension of the sufficiency of another man. It is continually being made aware that it is not you. It is Christ. That's spiritual growth. To constantly live in a state of awareness that none of this is defined by you. As I said, my ducks in a row didn't work out. And most people don't like to admit that because they seem to reflect poorly on them. But the problem is not... The, the problem is not that it reflects poorly on us. The real problem is that we think it's still about us. That's the issue. I mean, I could tell you stories. There's a lot of poor reflection if we could talk. But there is no poor reflection on the beauty of the face of the one who identifies my state who before God stands perfect and holy and blameless, and because I'm found in him, I, too, partake of that state. My soul is secured in the anchor that anchors it, him living in it. That's real. So Paul would say, of God are you in Christ. Him as a source are you in Christ, who's made unto us Righteousness or wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And he could have filled up a whole book with just those type of words describing who Christ has made unto us, what he is in us. And the fact is, he ends it by saying that no flesh should glory in his presence. He's made unto you all of these things so that he that boasts would boast only in the Lord, their spiritual growth. Are you capable of boasting in the sufficiency of another or are you still stuck on the desire to be able to find something in yourself, something in your effort, something in your obedience to boast in? Or do you fall on the rock and be broken and live in that state of absolute dependence every day where the constant need is constantly supplied for because he's present. There's spiritual growth. It allows you to boast in another sufficiency without feeling like it takes away from you. And it exposes you as weak. No, you boast in that. You glory in your weakness because in the midst of it, which is always there, he is sufficient. And that's why Paul prays for them to see Jesus. Because it answers the question. It answers all questions. And it's a constant need. So my prayer for all of us, for me especially, is to see the Lord. Is to have my eye, the eyes of my soul open to see a reality far greater than myself. So I can rest in it, not wrestle with it. So we'll stop there, guys. Amen.